When he smiled, it looked like the dawn. When he broke wind, the little fishes trembled. When he frowned, the ground shook. When he laughed, everybody got drunk. The Mouldy Jesus came on shore and picked out his twelve disciples. One cleaned toilets at the railway station. His hands were scrubbed red to get the shit out of the pores. One was a call girl who turned it up for nothing. One was a housewife who had forgotten the pill and stuck her TV set in the garbage can. One was a little office clerk who tried to set fire to the government buildings. Yes, and there were several others. One was an old sad queen. One was an alcoholic priest going slowly mad in a respectable parish. The Māori Jesus said, from now on, the sun will shine. He did no miracles. He played the guitar sitting on the ground. The first day, he was arrested for being a Māori and for having no means of support. The second day, he was beaten up by the cops for telling a D his house was not in order. The third day, he was charged again with being a Māori and given a month in Mount Crawford. The fourth day he was sent to Porirua for telling a screw the sun would stop rising. <coughs> the fifth day lasted seven years while he worked in the asylum laundry, never out of the steam. The sixth day he told the head doctor, I am the light in the void. I am who I am. The seventh day, he was lobotomized. The brain of God was cut in half. On the eighth day, the sun did not rise. It didn't rise the day after. God was neither alive nor dead. The darkness of the void, mountainness, Mile deep, civilized darkness set on earth from then until now. Kanui te mihi ki a koto e te rupu ne. E na iwi Māori ke te fano a hau o te rupu pāke no Aotearoa ko tanga te tira te iaho. Ko re ra ki a koto tanga te fena wa tanga taranga tira. A kanui te mihi, kanui te mihi, a ki a koto. E ngā mana mangu, ngā hoa no Pacific, ngā iwi o Aotearoa koutou katoa, tēnā koutou. Kei te mihi ki te whare nei, kei te mihi ki ngā mate, te tuahini whitu tirikata nei salabi. Tō of te rupu māngai, te rupu... Morihu, Hairi, Hairi, Hairi Rakwe e te tuahini. E nga tini mati tini ai tua Hairi. Nō reira ki a koutou, tu hongo ora tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki ora koutou katoa. I'm a white boy from Timaru. And, um, and this um, enables me to speak authoritatively, uh, but not as authoritatively over my brother, um, about, um, about uh, Rastafari and... Uh, Strugglers, the uh, sufferers, and now uh, Mokai. Uh, Robbie, um, thanks for helping your students uh, break out of the God zones clammy uh, self satisfaction of she'll be all right, wherein <laughs> politics and troubles of the world are always somewhere else, somewhere abroad or amongst others. It's serendipitous that we're holding this kōrero at this time. The events of this week in London and throughout urban England remind us of the volatility 
that can flare when the yoke of repression and the pressures of life explode and how self-defeating this undirected anger can be both in the actions of a destructive mob and the consequential crackdown by modern day ferrers in the guise of the democratic state. These are the similar to the events that in 1977 piqued my interest as to what was going on in Jamaica and in the Afro-Caribbean communities of Great Britain and caused me to travel to Kingston, Jamaica and to Brixton and to Toxteth to see for myself. And today we may be shocked by the acts of extrajudicial execution in Haiti or in the back of Wall and other garrison communities in Kingston, Jamaica, but not necessarily connect them with what happens here in Aotearoa, like the shooting to death of gang member Paul Chase of Petoni by the police when they stormed his home in the middle of the night and he emerged from his bedroom with an exercise bar of the shooting to death by the police of an unarmed gang member Daniel Hopopper in Tomaranui, of the shooting to death by the police of Stephen Wallace in Waitara when he was running amok with a golf club and the recent shooting to death by police of Anthony Ratahi in Opanaki when it appears that they had the matter under control. The common denominator is that they all come from the same state-held rod of correction. And as students, you have an obligation to actively pursue upraised consciousness. Hemi Baxter said, talking of Otago University, it is unlikely that anybody walking down Castle Street will get a bullet in the head from a Māori or an island man whose cousin was kicked to death by a cop in Auckland. The students are safe with booze, books or pot. So thanks Robbie and your colleagues from other faculties for your efforts to dig the below the myth of God's own and expose our white and sepulchres to the gaze of your tawira. The major thrust of my cordial today is whilst to acknowledge the reality of suffering that we must reject violence as our response to the plight of oppression and suppression and instead use the tools of asymmetric warfare, spiritual weapons, weapons of love, carried by music, song, poetry and theatre. Brother Tiggy in his document Street to Sky tells how he came to the realisation of the ultimate contradiction promised by our then route of action and his move to the communion promised by reggae and rasta. In 1978, as Keskiri Aroha, we came up with a little shibboleth, music speaks louder than words, because we recognised the spiritual power of music and the ability of lyrics to enter the consciousness when carried on a sweet note or drumbeat. And when we look at our land's traditions, we should remind ourselves that Tukuti, turn to prayer and meditation in the hahi of Ringatu. Remember the rejection of violence in the pathway to peaceful resistance set by Tohu and Tefiti. Some of us will recall the words of the Ngāti dread leader Kala, Chris Campbell, in his call for peace when he, called home, when he returned home to Ruatoria after his time in prison. Jimmy Baxter told us in Jerusalem J Book that the weapons for the slings of modern day Goliath, for modern day Davids in the battle against the Goliath of the modern day state, are the ancient water worn stones of the Māori, Arohanui, the love of the many, Manuhiritanga, the provision of hospitality to the stranger, Korero, the talking out of problems through reason. Matewa, the active nightlife of the soul, and mahi, collective work for a collective purpose. I acknowledge that the context of the topics covered today, sufferers, is synonymous with Rasta, but I'd like to suggest that the poor and marginalised of any period or ethnicity occupy the place and space of sufferer. 
that might be best examined through the lens of the overseer and the aims of enforcement of the will of Pharaoh. According to the official history of the New Zealand police policing the colonial frontier, the settler governments initially established the New Zealand police to control gangs of Pākehā whalers who were causing mayhem amongst Māori communities and threatening the stability of the settler state. This may explain the attachment the police have for sufferer gangs <coughs> and the significance they have traditionally placed on gangs as a proving means of ensuring their ongoing expansion and increased powers. It's ironic that the New Zealand police now themselves wage war against the very communities they were originally established to protect. In recent years, New Zealand's buy into the paradigm of the international criminal conspiracy meant that we positioned our sufferer gangs as organised criminal groups. And then this has been conflated with the war on drugs, followed by the war on terror. We have set up what oft-quoted sociologist Stanley Cohen calls moral panic, where fact, logic and proportionality go out the window. Against this background, the story we're examining today picks up pretty much from the early 1970s with the move to mechanisation and the large-scale migrations from the Pacific Islands and rural communities. Now the pa is all but empty. The children are few. One elder is left. The men are scattered like seeds to look for work in the towns. Some in the jails or the borstals, some in an office, some cut steel on a lathe. Only the graves and the ghosts remain at Hiduharama. And the river that floods from the hills and the gorges, swollen with mud, carrying down the dead and the green branch. The apocryphal work cooperative story of young Danny the Māori boy moving from pa to city is told in a little comic produced for the 1979 Keskiri tour. Danny confronts the destructiveness of his own behaviour and returns to his roots where he establishes a work cooperative and repopulates the kāinga in the context of the cordial, on the context of the cordial today, just note this little, little uh, logo down here, which was designed by Tiki. It, it, uh, it displays the, the palm tree of the Caribbean and the Pacific, the seared, shared seed of humanity, the roots into Africa, and the koru, koru of Aotearoa. Hard case talking about the work co-ops. When I wandered down here today, um, it was our work co-op that built uh, those crib walls there mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in about 1976 or something like that. Where are we going here, back? <coughs> Baxter turned, coined the term na mokai to describe the new how the to describe the newcomers to the city, sufferers, young Maori, the lost and lonely, the addicts, the alienated, the gang members, the brothers and sisters in jail or in the bin. Michael King perceptively saw that these people were tribeless and that these groupings and congregations were often a substitution for whānau, for hapu, for iwi, 